Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon to everyone. So um, uh, this is post lunch hour, so and the third session. So I hope everyone would not be sleepy during this session, and this session would be a very interactive session because um, we are going to speak on a very interesting topic, which is um, radicalization of state-centered power politics and polarization of the Islamic Ummah, which is a very important topic. Okay, um, uh, I would like to introduce our guest speaker for uh, this session. Um, on my left, this is Dr. Mahdi Ahui. He is the Assistant Professor and Director of Iranian Studies Program at the University of Tehran. So he received his PhD in International Relations from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies at the University of Geneva, Switzerland. And then uh, he received his master degree from University of Geneva, specializing in international history and politics. And his, before that, he started his undergraduate uh, and, uh, and graduated with a BA from the School of International Relations in Tehran. So uh, before starting his career as a professor, he has worked as a research fellow at several educational and research institutions in Iran and in Switzerland, including the International Center for Geopolitical Studies in Geneva and Institute for Political and International Studies uh, in Tehran. So I've looked through a few of Dr. Ahui's paper uh, online. He has written a lot about history of Iran's nuclear program, the, and then the IAEA, the Atomic Energy Association, then Iran's foreign policy objectives, security concern, global position, uh, Iran relationship with China, India, and Russia, and also Iran's geographic complexity and defensive capacity. Um, we are very um, honored to have uh, him as guest today because we want to see, uh, because of the escalating tension between uh, and the pol polarization between the Islamic Ummah, uh, more so after the, more so uh, increasing tension because of the Syrian conflict, which um, many had claimed that Iran is one of the major players in the region. Uh, okay, and then, um, okay. So the topic, first we are going to discuss about state-sponsored terrorism. So I would like to quote um, the meaning of state-sponsored terrorism. State-sponsored terrorism is a state's deliberate use of terrorism. Okay, okay. okay. Or assistance to terrorist organization as a foreign policy tool against other countries or groups of people. It can refer to either direct attacks by the state or support of terrorist organization through the provision of weapons, funds, training, and, sans and sanctuary. Okay. So, um, so I would hand the floor to Dr. Awi to start the topic. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with to be with you today. Uh, and I hope since this is after lunch session, uh, I don't sound very you know, boring to you. I, you know, I try um, to sound um, as interesting as, as possible. Uh, I need to have to do a little you know, modification because this topic is state sponsored of um, you know, terrorism. State and sponsored terrorism. Um, that was the that was the previous topic mentioned in the schedule for me. I don't know who who put that in the schedule on my behalf, but we basically changed it to the one that was mentioned at the beginning, which is radicalization of a state-centered power politics in the Middle East and radicalis and and polarization of the Islamic Ummah. What is the way out? Um, my field has been international politics, uh, and I and and I'm working on on foreign policy issues. So I'm, I'm quite happy that, that my friend, uh, you know, Professor Javad Miri this morning mentioned the sociological aspect uh, of finding the roots of extremism in the region. 
um, because, um, and of course, in, in his categorization, in his in, like, like three categories that he mentioned, um, I think, you know, politicization, um, politicization, um, you know, politicization of the situation uh, was something that he rejected as something unhelpful to say that uh, it, it goes beyond the government. It's something uh, um, deep-rooted in societies. Um, not that I, um, you know, disagree with that. Of course, this is true. Uh, but since my field is actually politics and international politics, I have to address the political side. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that category, which I still think is important. And I think that all uh, social factors are there. Uh, I'm going to mention some of them. But then I will go to the state level to see what is the role of the state in creating the current situation. Um, I'm not used to reading from my text. I never do that. Uh, but if, if you let me just read a few sentences as the introduction, and then I um, go to the main body of, of my presentation. Um, the Middle East region can, can be called the spiritual center of the Muslim world. The birthplace of all the three Abrahamic religions and the home of several thousand years of human civilization, this region is now burning in the flames of unprecedented violence and extremism, much of which is happening in the name of Islam. The existing sectarian conflicts in the Middle East have become more dirty and more destructive than anything seen before in this part of the world. What we see today is an anti-civilizational terror machine. Sometimes I call it you know, crash of civilization instead of clash of civilization, uh, which makes a mockery of Islamic faith. And, and portrays a Hobbesian, um, a Hobbesian picture of Muslim societies in the eyes of the people of the world. Much has been said about the socio-cultural and historical roots of the current extremism in the Muslim world. For example, the role of Western colonialism and interventions the, and lack of good governance in most parts of the Middle East have become most noticed. These important factors notwithstanding, this paper focuses on the role of current state-centered power politics in polarization and sectarianization of the Islamic Ummah, and on the critical task of the Muslim intellectuals and leaders of religious communities and civil society actors to stand against this, this process. So this morning, I heard um, one, you know, one of the gentlemen uh, saying that it's, it's, it, you know, it's actually basically all about politics, you know, all about power. It, it, you know, it's like a power struggle. Uh, we also mentioned politics of identity this morning. Uh, I agree with all that. And let me just go to the main body of my speak uh, by just mentioning something interesting to you. Just a few days ago, I was searching on internet about Abu Nasr Farabi. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He's one of the leading Muslim scholars of the 10th century. He was, you know, he was a philosopher and also at the same time, uh, you know, scientist. He 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 had expertise in many, you know, fields of science, you know, including mathematics and so on. Um, and then I read about his life, and I was really impressed that he was born somewhere in, you know, Turkestan, which is Kazakhstan of today, like in Central Asia, and then he moved to Baghdad. He was educated in, in Baghdad. Then he went to Aleppo, and he worked in Aleppo for the, uh, you know, for the government of, of that town. And then he moved to Damascus, and then he died there, and now he's buried in, in Damascus. So you know, I was astonished to you know, notice for a second this line, this you know, civilizational line extended from Central Asia to, to the Mediterranean Sea. And that was basically. What, what the Islamic world looked like uh, in the 10th century. And sometimes I say, well, that was only 400 years after the Prophet Muhammad. So they would know better than us what Islam was. I think their, their, you know, their interpretation was more accurate than what we have today. So you know, look at you know, Baghdad today, look at Aleppo, look at Damascus. And that's, that's what I mean by you know, crash of civilization, um, which is really. Um, you know, which is a pity. Um, I think 
I'm going today to, um, you know, to provide a two-layer uh, analysis. Um, I mentioned the importance of power politics. Uh, so on, on the first layer, I'm going to uh, apply a realist approach. I'm actually familiar with constructivist approaches, talking about uh, socio-cultural roots uh, which exist in the societies. I, you know, you know, we can mention a long list. You know, Javad Miri talked about education this morning. We can also add, for example, a sense of humiliation, a uh, sense of subordination that many people have, or you know, unemployment, joblessness, and poverty, and so on and so forth. All of these factors, which combined, uh, can lead to you know rise of extremism in any society, including Muslim societies. But I would like to highlight, because my field is actually international politics, uh, so you know, without any intention to downplay the other role, uh, you know, the other factors, I want to emphasize the role of the state in in this in this sad story that we see today in the Middle East. And uh, you know, for that reason, I you know, I think this is a realist approach that I'm going to you know provide. And on the second layer. I'm going to talk about intellectuals and the role of intellectuals. And by intellectuals, of course, this is also a broad term which should be defined. But in this case, I actually mean uh, you know, clerical leadership within religious communities. We need like, more local uh, you know, leaderships to, you know, to arise. Um, and in that sense, perhaps we can call it a, a sort of liberal approach, because I, you know, I put the emphasis on diversity within religious communities and autonomy of local communities that should be preserved. Well, I'm going to get to that layer at the end, but at the beginning, I actually begin with this state competition. All of you know, and I think I, I have to, you know, uh, you know, I have to clarify here, this is what, what I think, you know, coming from the Middle East. I think, well, we have all these problems in the Middle East, uh, you, know, you know, as I mentioned, lack of good governance and so on and so forth. This is clear, but I think this rivalry, this competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia in the past few years has been one of the main sources of the current mess in the region, no doubt. So I actually put the responsibility on the shoulders of these two states. Uh, but, you know, some people say that, um, you know, Iran is gaining influence especially in the Arab media, in the Arab world, if you pay attention to most of the Arab media, they talk about Iran gaining influence over four Arab capitals, Baghdad, Damascus, Beirut, and Sana'a. Uh, and they actually say that it's actually expanding and so on and so forth. Okay, maybe many people don't like that, okay? I also acknowledge you may not like Iran's influence, that's okay. But this, this is not a theological thing. This is actually a realist thing. This is, this is power politics, okay? But I'm going, um, you know, with that regard, let's imagine that this is a political competition and, and religion has been used to some extent as a means of this competition. But even with that assumption, let's get into some details and make a comparison between Iran and Saudi Arabia in that sense. Um, the, you know, the first thing I want to mention here is that Shia has always had this, uh, you know, a status of min, you know minority in the Islamic world. The Shiite people today, at most, they are 15 percent. Sometimes they say between 10 and 15 percent of the whole Muslim population of the world. In the Middle East, I think it's 35, you know, percent of the Middle East population is Shia. Um, so in that sense, Shia has always been in this minority status. Um, so Shiism as a religious ideology may not receive much support in the whole Islamic Ummah, nor will it be able to become predominant. Anyone who, can, who, who think that we can have a Shiite empire that would include many Muslim countries is basically is, is actually wrong because this, this can never happen simply because of the fact that the majority of Muslims are not Shiite. Okay, so in terms of ideology and theology, this is not an attractive uh, cause to that, you know, to that extent. Um, Shia has always been in a defensive position since its, 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 
emergence as a branch of Islam. And this is interesting for you to know that you know, primary jihad, you know primary jihad? We have two types of jihad. Primary jihad is actually forbidden in Shiite tradition in the absence of imam, because you know the last imam is hidden. So as long as imam is not present, uh, jihad, in a way, is forbidden except for defense. So that's, that's about infidels, let alone the Sunnis. Of course, we are not allowed to fight with the Sunnis or to open war against the Sunnis. If we, can't find, if, if, you know, if we cannot open war against infidels or non-Muslims, so this is a, this is a theological rule. The, the second point I want to say is that Iran, if you think about Islamic Republic of Iran and Islamic Revolution, what has been most interesting to people in the world, those who have been absorbed to uh, the idea of revolution, that, that has been because of the political message of Iran, not because of Shiite ideology. It was because of the political message of revolution that was against injustice, that was against you know, domination of the United States, that was against colonialism, imperialism, so on and so forth. Or maybe at the domestic level, it was a sort of uh, movement against you know, tyranny inside of the country. So that, that kind of message was appealing to people, not, not the Shiite essence of revolution. You know what I mean? The Shiite essence of revolution was used inside of the country, yes. We, we have, uh, you know, inside of the country because the majority of people were Shiite and are Shiite, that was appealing to them. But outside of the country, in terms of foreign policy, Shiism per se has never been so, um, you know, attractive. What has been attractive uh, from Iran has been its, its political message rather than, uh, you know, religious ideology. This is very important because of the conclusion I want to make on that basis. Um, let me make the example, you know, I don't want to be, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not a fan of, you know, Mr. Ahmadinejad, I'm actually a critic of him, but, you know, I think he can actually represent a good example, you know, because Ahmadinejad was quite popular in the streets of Arab world, and even in Southeast Asia, in Turkey, you know, many people, you know, liked him. Uh, did these people like him because he was Shiite? Or because he actually, he, you know, he was a strong believer in this millenar uh, you know, millenarian, you know, interpretation of Shiism? Of course not. I think he was popular because of his anti-Americanism, anti-Israel slogans, and so on and so forth. So that was, that's what I mean by this political message coming from Iran. Um, the third point I want to say is that Shiite communities in the Middle East, they never want to become the puppets of Iran. If you go and ask the, Lib you know, the Lebanese, I even have you know, friends who are, you know, who are close to Hezbollah in Lebanon. You know, when I talk to them, they never tell me that they aspire to have an Islamic Republic type in Lebanon. They never say that. They say we are very proud of our system in Lebanon. We have diversity, we have coexistence. And, and if you go to Bahrain, if you go to Iraq, if you go to Yemen and talk to the Shiite people, they never say that they want to become Iranian you know, agents or they want to have a revolution or they want to have a coup d'etat or they want to have a you know, government similar to that of Iran. What do they want? I think what they want is to have full rights as citizens. If you go to Bahrain and ask the Bahrainis what they want, they want their, their just legal, legitimate rights as just normal citizens to be able to live in that country. If you go to Bahrain, if you go to Yemen, if you go to Iraq, the same thing. So the point is that, you know, this is, this is a delicate uh, distinction I make here. Uh, the, you know, the message coming from Iran is anti-oppression. The, you know, the political message that I mentioned. It's about freedom, anti-oppression. The people who are most oppressed in this region has, have happened to be Shiite. This has happened, this has been an, a sort of accident. You know, there was no systemic link here. The Shiites have been discriminated in Bahrain, in Lebanon, in Yemen, elsewhere. And now we have you know, a message coming from Iran saying that you should rise for, you know, for, your, you know, for your own rights, and they rise up. And suddenly you think that these people are the, you know, are the agents of Iran. This is not true because this has happened. I mean, the message sender and the message recipient have happened to be both Shiite, but that has not been systemic. Um, 
this is also a delicate distinction you have to make. It let me, it, you know, let me tell you, this is, this is my judgment. If the Shiite people had received their legal rights that they deserved, Iran's political message would not have entertained them as much. If you take this, then you, then you understand what I mean. Um, the, fourth, you know, the fourth point is that even if one is not happy about Iranian influence in the Middle East, one cannot claim that it's going to have a global influence. I mean, uh, uh, you, know, in, in, you know, in the best case scenario, we talk about four Arab capitals, and you know, I don't think we can really add to the list. There are no more countries. I mean, this is like, you know, maybe Bahrain can be added at the end of the day. But it cannot go more than five, six countries. Then, and they are all in the same region, okay? So Iran does not have, uh, you know, does not pose a global threat to the whole Muslim world or the, you know, to the whole Muslim Ummah um, because of its Shiite ideology. Um, for example, about Malaysia, about Indonesia, I don't think there is anything that Iran can, uh, can, can become threatening against these countries, um, even if we don't like the influence. This is in, in that assumption. The, but let me just say that if you compare, because my, my intention was to compare with Saudi Arabia, I began with the Iranian side, and if we shift to the Saudi side, we see that Saudi Arabia basically, if, if we take Wahhabism as, as the case, I think this is a state-sponsored ideology uh, of hate, you know, I can call it, of you know, separation, um, which has a systemic link and a global web. If you go around the world, even in, in Europe, in America, uh, in Southeast Asia, everywhere, you have this global network that is working. Hundreds of mosques, hundreds of madrasas, hundreds of schools, which are sponsored by Saudi Arabia to advocate for a certain type of thinking. This has not been the case with Iran. You know, Iran has not been in that position ever. Um, we can't find anything equal to Wahhabism on the Iranian side. Because as I said, Iran, in the best case scenario, we have a political message. We cannot advocate for Shiism because Shiism is in the minority status. How can we, do we want to convert all the people to Shiism? This is a mess. This is not feasible. What we can absorb people with is our political message. But it's not comparable to Wahhabism because Wahhabism is, 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 is actually another, has, a, has, a, you know, has another essence. What kind of political message Saudi Arabia has for the world? Can you, can you mention to me? Um, what kind of political message? Just imagine we want, you know, we want to find something equal to Iranian political message from the Saudi side. Is this uh, familial monarchy? Is this dictatorship? Is this inaction towards Israel? Is this collaboration with the United States under any circumstances? Or is this buying everything, even respect, with petrodollars? These messages are not attractive to anyone, even to Muslims. So what is, at you know, what is attractive here is not a political message, but it's, it's, a, it's a religious sect. It's a religious interpretation, which is quite dangerous. Why? Because it tries to homogenize the Sunni communities and to say that all Sunni you know, population should, should believe in this particular interpretation of Islam. In a way, it's a unitary um, approach to Islam that, that is quite dangerous because uh, I think uh, homogeneity is not unity. Homogeneity means suppression in a way, is, is actually you know, oppressive in a way and can lead to extremism very easily. Um, so which influence is, is more dangerous? Iran's influence among a few millions of Shiite population in some countries of the Middle East who have happened to find Iran's political message appealing given their discriminated status within their countries, or Saudi influence through a spread of Wahhabism and tech-free way of thinking across the whole world, even in Southeast Asia. Iran, you know, this is interesting perhaps, um, Iran has a political influence with, a religious, with, with religious backing, but Saudi Arabia has a religious influence with political backing. You know, these are two different things. Um, 
I think the latter is more alarming because it can be deeper and more widespread and at the same time more you know, covered and invisible. Okay, so you know, what is the way out? Let's, let's talk about the solutions because this is the second layer I want to talk about. So although I think that this uh, state-centered power politics or uh, struggle for power has been the cause of so many problems, I don't want to uh, sound you know, apologetic about Iranian policies. I have my own criticism. Those who know me, they know that my, you know, part of my job in Tehran is actually to actually criticize the official policies. This is what I do on a daily basis. So I'm a, you know, I'm a very critical person in its own place. But in a, you know, in a comparison, if I want to compare Iranian and Saudi sides, I think that the Saudi uh, you know, influence is, is more dangerous because of the things that I mentioned, because it's, it's not you know, just a political message, a political influence can always be debated. One day it actually begins, another day it comes to an end. But a religious influence, like the influence of Wahhabism, is, is actually more dangerous because it can become destructive to the foundations of Islamic faith. What is the way out? One of the solutions that I think, as, a, as an international relations expert, if I can call myself so, I think if we can contain the political problem and this competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia, that will help a lot. You know, a lot, a lot, a lot. Yes, we know about Daesh, we know about, uh, th you know, things which have uh, gone um, out of control. Maybe, you know, maybe nowadays even Saudi Arabia has no control over, the, you know, Daesh. Maybe one, you know, once upon a time the Saudis supported Daesh, but nowadays they can't. I mean, you know, they don't. And they can't even control Daesh anymore. I mean, Daesh has been unleashed in a way. Yes, that is true. We have so many problems. We have like imported terrorists from Europe who have come to the Middle East, uh, like you know, adventurers and so on and so forth. But uh, still, I think if Iran and Saudi Arabia want to stabilize the region, they can, despite all the problems. So you know, what we should focus on, if we, you know, if we have any you know any any influence, and this is what. And, you know, I know that back in Tehran, many people are doing that. To provide our governments, maybe on the Saudi side, I don't know anyone here, but at least on the Iranian side, I know that there are some strives to uh, pave the way for a conciliation between the two states. If that happens, this can control a lot of the problem. Um, the second solution which can be a real, well, this, this first solution that I mentioned, you know, I actually wrote it here, it can be a painkiller. It can be a painkiller. If we can reduce the tension between, you know, between Iran and Saudi Arabia, it's good, but it's not, perhaps, it's not a real treatment of the problem of extremism, but it can be a painkiller maybe for the moment it doesn't let it go uh, further. Um, a real treatment, in my opinion, which would be long-lasting, uh, is for religious communities to keep more autonomy from states and to keep more diversity within themselves. So, um, you know, as I said, you know, diversity is, 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 is not equal to schism. S you know, I mean, S-C-H-I-S-M, not, not shiism. Uh, schism, sorry. Yeah, yeah. That means recognition of local religious leaders to play more important roles in representing the voice of their constituency. Um, homogeneity is not unity, but it's a poison to religious communities and a way towards extremism and excessiveness. Uh, so, in a way, um, I think we should actually prevent homogenization of, um, of you know, making, you know, you know, both Sunni and Shiite side we should keep diversity from within. And one way is to give more autonomy to local authorities, I mean, I mean, you know, religious authorities. Within both Shiite and Sunni communities, we need more autonomy of local clerical authorities. In Shiism, we have a mechanism for that. We have the mechanism of, you know, marja'iyya. Marja'iyya, uh, to some extent, it's actually similar to Catholicism, but it's, but it's more diverse. Because in, in, you know, in the popal system, you only have one pope. And then that can also be quite, uh, 
you know, absolutist, because the Pope says the last word, the, you know, the last word. But in Shi'ism, in the Marja'iyah system, Marja means reference. The, the, high, the, the, uh, the, you know, the ulama in the highest ranking of religious authority are called Marja. They can be a few. I mean, they can be maybe five, six, ten. You know, it depends. So there's no one person, okay, at the top. And if, you know, imagine just a few years ago, we had Allama Muhammad Hussein Fadlullah living in Lebanon. He was a marja in Lebanon. He was a very respected cleric in Lebanon, Lebanese cleric. And as long as he was there, I, you know, I think there was more balance, you know, because, you know, anyways, he was actually critical of Iranian government. But, but the government in Iran uh, had to respect him anyways because he was a very respected alim. Uh, and this would you know, basically uh, you know, keep the balance. If we have more marja, more local marja in Iraq, you know, Ayatollah Sistani, in my opinion, should take more charge, should become more active. Sometimes he's too conservative and too like, passive because he doesn't want to risk. But I think if he takes charge in Iraq, if Hashto Shabi, this, uh, this you know, army of volunteers, the Shiite volunteers, uh, work under the control of Ayatollah Sistani, that would be much better, much, much better, with much less uh, side effects. If we have like Marjahs in Yemen, in Bahrain, who would talk about their own communities, then we can actually separate, you know, little by little, the, these, these uh, you know, religious communities from the influence of a state. Um, on the Sunni side, we also used to have Al-Azhar, more active, more, uh, more influential in the, um, you know, in the past, like 50 years ago, Al-Azhar was basically the, the main marja in the Sunni world. And nowadays, how much do you hear from Al-Azhar? It's quite silent and, you know, passive. So we need something like that, which would also, but maybe something like, um, you know, even more than one Al-Azhar. That would, you know, you know, maybe you know, another Al-Azhar in Southeast Asia, maybe here in you know, Malaysia or Indonesia, that would represent the voice of the people of Southeast Asia. And then you know, maybe that's not similar to the people of Egypt or you know, North Africa. So uh, that, that could be one of the ways to basically contain the effect of the state. Um, let me you know, tell you something. This is something that needs further research. I'm, I'm not very knowledgeable about it, but I just, I just bring up the issue here because this is not, this is not really my field. <laughs> um, but I think you know, we, have the con we have imported the concept of you know, the, no you know, the notion of nation state in the Middle East. The nation state as a concept comes from Westphalia. In, in Europe, as you are you know, familiar with. And one of the clauses in Westphalian you know, treaty, if you go and read the actual Westphalian treaty, one of the clauses is that the king of the land A has no right to impose its own, his own religion on the king of the land B. So every king has uh, sovereignty in his own land, even in terms of religion. But when we imported it into the Middle East, we basically neglected this, this you know, simple clause. And now we have nation states which are trying to use religion in, in their, in their um, you know, political rivalries. The point is that something, something more interesting happened. We had the term milla in, in Farsi and also in Arabic, milla. And you know, if, if, you, if you have the term ummah, because ummah, I have used the term ummah in, in the title of my paper, the units, the, the subunits of ummah was milla, basically. And then the combination of milla would, would, would you know, what would actually constitute ummah. Milla, when in the 19th century we wanted to find an equal term, you know, equivalent for nation states, which was imported from the West, we used the term milla in this combination. We say millat dolat in, you know, nowadays in Farsi, we say millat dolat, you know, milla dola, in, you know, in, in, you know, uh, for, you know, for nation state, which is, I think, you know, quite misleading because since 19th century, we have started to think that milla means something bound by political boundaries. Whereas before, milla was actually something more than, you know, political boundaries. It was like the whole religious community could be called milla. In, for example, we had the, Shi you know, we had the Shiite Milla. 
and that would go beyond the borders of Iranian state of today, you know, for example. So in that sense, I think we should you know, make a distinction between nation as in the term nation state and nation as in the term religious community, you know, as, you know, as a religious community. And uh, we should think that you know, neither Saudi Arabia should represent Sunni Muslims nor Iran should represent the whole Shiite population of the world. Sunni and Shiite communities must make their voice heard independent of the will or, or the interests of certain states who claim to be the godfather of those sects. This requires a strong, highly mobilized intellectual efforts. And uh, by that, I think I've, I know, I've come to the end of my talk. Sorry if it didn't make any sense, but I just shared some of my thoughts with you here. And I, I'm actually looking forward to you know, questions and answers. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Awi, for his presentation. So he mentioned about a religious institution being without aut autonomy from the state, like a recognition of religious leaders uh, to have diversity from within, like the system of Shiism that have the marja system. Um, So I have a question. So uh, that is the case uh, that happened, that caused pol polarization more in the Middle East. If in our region of Southeast Asia, like giving example Malaysia, uh, I think that the religious institution, uh, they have an influence to the state. Like Jakim have influence to the state. The state sermons, like the Friday sermons, come from the religious institution. And the religious institution in Malaysia are demonizing, I'm giving example, demonizing the Shia and the other religious minorities. And they are giving, they are providing these sermons uh, to the state, uh, I mean, uh, to the state level so that the state uh, can uh, so that the state mosque will uh, will propagate this um, this polarization in their give example Friday sermons. Do you get do you get my question? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I take the autonomy for the first question. Sorry. Um, yes. Maybe this this needs clarification because when I say more autonomy, maybe one would say that with with more autonomy things can can uh, get like. You know, more out of control because uh, you have in, like autonomous clerical establishments who can issue fatwas on their own, and then you never know what's what's happening. So if we have a state at least in charge, state can somehow check the the, the you know the activities of these institutions. Yes, this is the current situation, unfortunately. But if we have real religious institutions which are free of any influence of uh, like you know you know free of outside influence then I don't think that would be the case, necessarily. I mean, uh, yes, because you know, nowadays many of these institutions receive funding from Saudi Arabia, directly or indirectly. So at the end of the day, or the imams have been trained in Saudi Arabia or by Saudi clerics. So in a way, they are somehow spreading the same ideas as the Saudis want. And that's my point, that this is exactly the problem. That one version, one you know, one ideology, has has been able to homogen, you know, you know, basically to homogenize all uh, you know all other Muslims, and to and to you know basically uh, um, damage diversity within the Muslim you know communities. So, just right now, I think you have the right to be worried about it. But what I said was just you know, something like a model that needs to be constructed. It's not something that we can uh, do from tomorrow. Uh, it, it needs a new construction in order to avoid this danger. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, I just have uh, uh, two questions. One is, um, whatever happened to the Amman message? Um, and the, the second one is, 
reading the history of Iran and Russia, and before that, um, the um, with Britain involving in the uh, the big uh, great game of the 18th, 19th centuries. Um, how is the feeling among the people of Iran today towards the warming up of relations with, with Russia and what is seen um, by some as um, a new alliance between uh, Iran and Russia? Thank you. So by, by Amman message, you mentioned uh, you know, the one which was issued a couple of years ago, right? Um, I, uh, you know, I don't know what was your question about, what, what happened to that. But I think that was a very good piece. Uh, I mean, if if you're talking about the same document, I th you know I think this this uh, uh, yeah 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 you know I think it was it was fantastic. I mean the content was really good, and that could be a guideline. But uh, we need to you know define mechanisms how to implement that. And you know unfortunately it was completely uh, forgotten after the rise of Daesh and all the mess in Iraq and you know, Syria, it was issued before. I mean, it was in, in, in the, uh, you know, maybe it was 10 years ago at least. But isn't it timely now? Exactly. Exactly, exactly, I agree, sure. Um, about Iran and Russia, um, I can't talk um, for all Iranian people because I, I don't know what they think. But at least, I mean, as a university professor and someone who has um, enough contact to evaluate the environment, I can tell you that many people are critical of that. And uh, this is a policy that perhaps some uh, fractions within the government uh, are following, this alignment with Russia. But if you go to the public opinion, there's basically no support for that. I have, I have barely heard any positive comment uh, from the public arena uh, you know the you know the public sphere about uh, the, the, this this kind of relationship. So we, you know, the public opinion is still quite <coughs> skeptical of Russia, and is the memory is still quite alive of the 19th century, as you mentioned. Uh, the irony is that uh, we still have anti-British slogans coming from the government, like officially. Uh, but we, and and if and if you talk about Britain, what what Britain has done recently, well, it's all like you know I don't know maybe it's just made up stories. But the main thing that Britain did was in the 19th century, and if you want to go back to that time, then you should also remember Russia because what's the you know what's the difference then? So I don't think that this. I mean I think many figures even within the government have have realized that you know Russia is not really a trustworthy ally at the end of the day. It's more like a Someone said in, in uh, uh, Farid, how do you say is the Vajra Maslahati? Marriage of interest. Yeah, that that was exactly the term that a Russian expert used in Tehran. He was he was talking in Tehran, and he he said, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> anyways, I I. Um, I think that at the end of the day, it's mm, not a, a deep-rooted alignment. Dr. Mahdi, uh, my name is Prakalat, a reporter. Uh, my question is basically, is there any methods for Tehran to intervene and prevent <coughs> this demonization of sh the Shia minorities, especially in the Southeast Asian context? Because the last time there was a series of demonization I did watch a YouTube video by one of the Iranian-based lawmakers called for <coughs> a cut in diplomatic ties, and then the National Petroleum Company from Malaysia lost a few contracts in Iran. Your question was my, my question more is intervention from Tehran what, to uh, prevent uh, to prevent Shiite, uh, demonization of Shiites in, in Southeast Asia. In Southeast Asia. In in terms of public diplomacy, you mean, or in terms of formal diplomacy? The linkage, I mean, uh, the linkage. The linkage. I mean uh, especially if, I mean, uh, we understand that it's not recognized, but at the same time, our government can sign the Amman message. So isn't there any uh, methods that can be used by Tehran? 
to prevent demonization, discrimination against the minority Shiites based in Southeast Asia? Well, I think the, well, you know, this is a complicated question because it's about policy making. You know, I, I'm not in that position, but I think, I mean, I can guess that, uh, you know, the official, uh, you know, response to that is that Iran thinks that if it intervenes in that story openly, it can even complicate the situation more. Uh, so, you know, we try to. Uh, you know, to keep away as much as possible, I mean, at least officially speaking, uh, not to make any official or tangible links between uh, the two sides of the story. Uh, but, you know, perhaps we can use means of public diplomacy, as every country does, uh, in order to uh, change the environment. But if Iran can, can you know, officially do that, I, I mean, you know, I don't think that would be on, you know, on the agenda, because that can you know, basically uh, end up at the expense of the Shiite communities uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, okay, Assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Majid. Uh, my question is about the Iran's foreign policy. Uh, you mentioned in your speech that uh, uh, Iran is actually intervening in societies or countries where the Shia minorities are oppressed. But uh, we, we can also see that uh, happened in Egypt and other where, elsewhere in, in uh, the Arab Spring. But when the thing happened in uh, Syria, where the uh, government is uh, a small minority, the Iran government stood with it and also helped it uh, financially and also sent troops from all over the world, including the Shia from Afghanistan. So what do you say about that? Thank you. Well, the, the support uh, in the Arab Spring, I mean, was also not a sort of, I mean, it was not a physical support, of course. It was more uh, sort of sympathy coming from Iran. I don't think that Iran sent any, you know, logistics to the revolution in Egypt. Um, well, the, you, know, you know, the question of Syria is really, you know, complicated. And I, you know, I think it goes beyond my ability and time to get into the whole story. But it's quite debatable and you know, controversial when you talk about um, the situation. And I'm, and I'm not, you know, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, to justify anything. Of course, uh, you know, Assad also uh, had, had, it, had, had his own mistakes. And his main mistake was that in the first place, he did not accept to have enough reforms in order to satisfy the people. Who, were, who, at the time, they were not really, uh, you know, armed. At, you know, at that time, we, we didn't have like terrorist groups as much. It was just like more like a you know reformist, uh, you know, movement. Even before Arab Spring, he could have started some kind of domestic reforms, but he he resisted, and that is, I think, that was his 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 actually biggest mistake. The point was that uh, we we thought. In Iran, I mean, you know, to be honest with you, we thought that the thing in Syria uh, goes beyond the, you know, Syria as a state goes goes beyond its domestic affairs. It's 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 a sort of uh, regional or international plan in which Syria is just a piece of puzzle. And because of that interpretation, maybe that was a wrong interpretation. I'm not I'm not actually taking side with anyone. I'm just telling you. Like in a, in, a, in, a, in a descriptive way, what happened in the minds of the people in Tehran. That we thought that things in Syria are happening not because Assad was a dictator you know, alone, but because you know, there were some hidden plans uh, that would follow after the fall of Assad. And that could even be extended to Iran. Uh, so in a way, you know, the reaction that Iran showed uh, was justified on a defensive basis that we need to do something in order to, do, you know, to, to actually defend ourselves because if we don't stand here, if, you know, if we don't stand firm here, then the next uh, scenario can happen in Iran, you know, or about Iran. In any way, I don't know how, you know, however possible. But we thought that after Assad, it would be Iran's turn in a way. So. Since we, we, since we had this interpretation that, that you know, the case of Syria is not just limited to Syria itself, it, it, you know, it, you know, it's not just a sort of reformist movement wanting reform and so on and so forth, 
but it goes beyond that level, uh, then you know we decided somehow to to stand up to uh, you know to actually prevent that from happening. And then uh, I would not agree with you because uh, well you know maybe nowadays well Assad uh, has become of course less popular compared to you know five years ago. But I really doubt if in 2011, when this uh, you know conflict broke out, I doubt I don't necessarily agree with you that Assad. Uh, at that time was hated by all the people of his country. We don't know that. What was the evaluation? Was there any elections? Was there any referendum? Was there any survey? We don't know. So these are all like, you know, claims that Assad was, was, you know, was that unpopular. I'm talking about 2011. Don't get me wrong. Maybe today it has, you know, it has changed after all the problems and you know, destructions. But even today, if you go to Damascus, and you know, you know, under places which is under the state control, I think that he still has some kind of popularity, and uh, uh, the, you know, this is very interesting. If you if you if you pay attention to Syrian army, uh, you see that very few generals, very few, handful of generals, have basically you know broken up with Assad. Most of them have remained. That was that was uh, you know this you know this was the other way around with Saddam Hussein in Iraq. As soon as the war uh, you know started, many of the generals basically betrayed Saddam Hussein and they basically helped the United States in in, in in its operation. Here for five years, just only a handful of army generals have basically fled or have left their you know their uh, their. You know loyalty to Assad. So that shows you know we you know we are not in the place of Syrian people. We need an exact, accurate evaluation of of the environment. We don't know what what they want. You know I'm not in a position to say that if they want Assad or or if they don't want Assad. Okay. As long as we don't have an election or a free referendum, we can't really you know evaluate that. So in 2011, I totally disagree that Assad was so unpopular that he. Uh, had to had to leave immediately as as this movement broke out. Um, one, you know, maybe I can about you know intervention. I you know I can also say that the number of Iranians fighting in Syria uh, has been very minimal compared to other you know to other countries. If you compare to the number of Saudi fighters in Iraq. Uh, that would be like you know very very much you know lower. And I'm, you know I don't want to you know blame. I mean you know basically you know because this is a blame game and it can continue forever. But I think the main responsibility, if anything, in Syria has happened. I think the main responsibility should be taken by Russia, not by Iran. I think this has been misleading. This has been the media, uh, you know, manipulation. And I think the Russians have also helped that because they want to say that we didn't make any mistake. Uh, but for example, in Aleppo, I think that Iranians were not really in Aleppo. It was it was the Russian army and the Syrian army, and uh, you know I don't know maybe a few like maybe a handful of Iranians were around. Uh, but how come that everybody talks about Iran but not about Russia as much? Okay, uh, Nicole, uh, my name. Uh, my question is related to you talk about uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran actually you know working something out. But maybe what you should also add on is what is the impediments to actually this happening? What is stopping this? And I think maybe you should have given a bit of context to the fact that uh, Saudi Arabia has always been anti-Iran simply because Iran has overthrown the monarchy, which if Saudi Arabia were to embrace the politics of Iran, you know, I think what Iran has given to the world is a politics of undoing despair with its revolution, with showing, so maybe that's, what you said. So maybe, and, and when we talk about put, comparing Iran with Saudi Arabia in terms of terrorism, uh, I think it's not at all even a comparison because we need to uh, put into also context the fact that the greatest terror was committed to the Iranian people themselves. The sanctions which was placed by the United States overthrew of its democratic ideals. Um, so maybe if we could give a context, and my second thing would be is about Russia. Uh, 
I think the game is not so much about Iran being on the side of Russia or not. It's about the US making a model that if you are with us or you're not with, uh, if you're not with us, you're, you're with them. And I think the problem is one has to recognize that when sanctions were placed on, Russia, on, the, uh, on Iran, it was Russia who played a, a reading role in actually trading and actually helping so much of the economy. So I would like to know what is the justifications of uh, per se, um, you know, saying that Russia is not a, 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 a reliable partner because this, this plays all out into the Cold War pricks politics, you know, and it's a very dangerous form of politics. And we know it's a possible uh, nuclear war. And just one last tiny, tiny point is about um, the, uh, the nuclear uh, Saudi Arabia and OPEC. I think until even now, we see that Saudi Arabia is not willing to come to the tables with uh, Iran because Saudi Arabia refuses to actually cape its OPEC oil. Uh, and it wants Iran, which is a country that just came out. So I think whether is it even compatible, maybe what is the real threat of Iran, like what Noam Chomsky asked, what is the threat of Iran in today's world, that we won't have to have a discussion? What is it even able to do? Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, the main problem uh, for the Saudis is with, with the revolution itself. I mean, I think this was a few days ago, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, the second crown prince, uh, he said that openly, that the main reason for our opposition to Iran is because of its revolution of 1979. Well, okay, if, if that is, then you know, this is the end of conversation. Because otherwise, then uh, you should have a regime change in Iran. But the point is that even with a regime change in Tehran, I don't think that from a purely political perspective, the competition will not come to an end. Because if that is so, then it should have been the case under the Shah, you know, before the revolution. If, if, you can, if you can show me that under the Shah we had a very friendly relationship, then I agree that perhaps the problem lies with the Islamic Republic and then when it's, um, you know, if it's ousted, then, that, you know, then you know, everything will be fine. But even at the time of the Shah, we had a very uh, difficult relationship with Saudi Arabia. You, you mentioned OPEC. OPEC was also a problem in the 70s. A lot, a lot, a lot. And even since the 70s, the Saudis have always wanted to control the oil price. Um, but I think what I called here the, you know, the crash of civilization. If we really, I mean, I think uh, in some, like, you know, regional, um, you know, integration theories. Uh, one has been put forward by, you know, Professor Amitav Acharya from National University of Singapore that I like very much. He says that even the states uh, which have, uh, you know, contradictions in terms of ideology or even states which have conflicts over land, they have territorial problems, they can sometimes come to terms and, and work together if, if they realize that the, that, the, you know, that the existence of the whole region in which they live is under threat. <laughs> and I think nowadays, this is what, what's happening in the Middle East. We should, we should understand that the whole region is basically, co in, you know, in a way, it's actually collapsing. Because look at the number of failed states in this part of the world. This is astonishing. It's competing with Africa now. And this is a pity because Middle East is not Africa. It's very wealthy in terms of natural resources. We have a lot of oil. We have a long history of civilization uh, in terms of culture. Uh, you know, there's a rich history. So in a way, I think, uh, you know, if you see that a rich region in culture and even wealth is declining, it's quite alarming. So I think if we have wise uh, you know, rulers, uh, on, on the Saudi side and, uh, and reformist rulers on the Iranian side, uh, like something you know, under Abdullah, for example, and Mr. Rafsanjani, the late Mr. Rafsanjani, uh, or Mr. Khatami, we had experienced it before sometimes. Um, so I think despite all the problems, we are not supposed to, to, to solve all the problems. We have our you know, ideological problems. Uh, but we can also cooperate in order to guarantee that the region uh, will survive. Why Russia is not reliable? Well, I, um, you know, I don't want to, to be judgmental on that, but I think um, one of the reasons uh, is that we think that, that Russia has been you know, playing uh, uh, you know, Iran card in its relations with the United States. 
So whenever they want to put more pressure on the United States or to, to gain concessions, uh, they use Iran as a card in their game. And then once uh, they are satisfied or they have good relations with the US, then they, they pay less attention to Iran. Now we have to wait for uh, the presidency of Trump. And that will be a big test. Because we suppose that relations between uh, in Russia and United States will improve. And this is quite alarming for us in Iran, because we think that once it happens, Russia uh, will not really uh, keep so, so close to Iran anymore. Uh, they just you know, they, they just used it in order to actually uh, you know, regulate their, you know, their relations with the United States. If that, we, uh, if, if, you know, if, 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 if that is not the case, or maybe, you know, maybe this is misunderstanding, if the Russians can show that we are wrong and they are, they are you know, really genuinely uh, you know, working with Iran, then I don't think there will be any problem. But up to now, I'm, I'm just reflecting uh, what we think uh, in, in Tehran. Um, in terms of OPEC, I think recently there has been some more openings. Uh, and Saudi Arabia and Iran basically work together, uh, you know, officially work together in order to increase the price in the oil market. And that was successful. We also somehow indirectly worked together in Lebanon to establish the new government of Lebanon. And as you know, as you know in Lebanon did not have a president and a government for two years. And after the operation in, in, in Mosul and in, you know, and in Aleppo, there was the danger that uh, you know, Daesh and, you know, and, and Nusra you know, forces would move to Lebanon. And in that case, we would witness a civiliz you know, civilizational collapse in the whole Mediterranean area. Uh, so in order to prevent that, I think Saudi Arabia and Iran, just in the right time, uh, they agreed. They just um, you know, made equal concessions. And we had a president who is supported by Hezbollah. And we have a prime minister who is supported by Saudi Arabia. And now this, you know, this country is actually is, is back to normal, fortunately. So these are some of the examples that shows that uh, if we have wisdom, then uh, we, you know, we can still, I mean, we can keep all the problems, we can all you know, keep all the differences, but we can also work together uh, to, to keep the region uh, sur uh, you know, survive. Um, I, I felt very enlightening when you mentioned about the Saudi versus Iran sort of politics dominance. OK, I was very enlightened by your theory that you put where there is this Saudi versus Iran uh, dominance of power in the Middle East. But um, would you, in your opinion, agree that it has got more to do with this uh, Shiism sort of uh, uh, conflict? Uh, it is more towards the Arab versus Iran sort of uh, dominance. Now, if you look back to history, Iran has got a few thousand years of civilization. They were once a great regional power. And if you read history, they were so powerful that they can match the Greek uh, power at that time. And the Arabs, if you look at it, uh, their short history, in their socio-economic fabric, they were, they were more of nomads. And uh, they were tribal in nature. And they were also victims of colonization. One good example is that they were under the rule of the Ottomans for a few hundred years by their fellow Muslims. And then uh, at the end of the, sec the First World War, the British came in. The Western powers came in. They carved out Middle East. And uh, at that point in time, they discovered oil, which then installed uh, the monarchy in, in certain parts of the, the Middle East. And with these Western powers that were trying to be what you call the puppet master behind them. So uh, would you, uh, in your opinion, that given the current scenario in oil politics, you know, with the prices going down, with the cheap oil being produced by US, the, the, the what what oil you call that shale oil. So, yeah, much cheaper. 
so the the issue of oil politics in the Middle East will now be relegated to a less uh, volatile level. How would this impact the current um, Saudi versus Iran sort of uh, dominance there? I think you know your comment slash you know slash question was um, composed of you know different layers, so I have to go one by one. I you know I agree that perhaps from the Saudi side it's more like Arab you know Persian competition, but um, you know I remember I was in you know I was in Qatar a few months ago for a, you know one of these you know track two dialogues. That was a closed session, maybe 15 you know you know people at large, uh, you know at most. And uh, some, you know, some people from Saudi side, some people from, you know, from Iran, and that was intended to be a, like a dialogue between Iran and the, uh, you know, people of the Gulf. And one of the Saudis, we, you know, we were just having, you know, dinner at the, you know, at the, you know, at the, at the dinner table. We were talking about Iran buying like new airplanes from, you know, Boeing and Airbus, as you know, the, you know, the contracts have been signed. And uh, this guy from Saudi Arabia was really, really um, concerned about it. And he said that in, in just one contract, you, you, you have actually going, you, know, you have bought more than 100 airplanes. And in another contract, you will buy another 100 you know, airplanes. And then you're, you're, uh, you, have plan, uh, you have plans to construct 300 hotels, like you know, five-star, four-star hotels. And if you know, that really works, <coughs> then what can we do about it? We will lose all the tourists who would, who would go to the south of the Persian Gulf. And you know, I think he's right. I mean, if you calculate in terms of number, the whole GCC states, you know GCC, I mean the whole combination of um, you know, Arab states in the Persian Gulf area, the whole population is about 35 million, which is half of, of the population of Iran. So the whole country, like six countries together combined, they only have half of Iran's population. They are, I think they have the right to be afraid <laughs> because Iran, I mean, uh, you know, sometimes I think it's like, a, it's like an old lion which is somehow trapped. And then if it's freed, it, 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 you know, it can still become somehow scary to, to the surrounding. Uh, but you know, honestly, this is not our fault. <laughs> this is if, if we have like capacities uh, you know, in our economy, in our you know, natural resources, in, uh, in you know, the size of our land. This is not something that we, we can be blamed for. This, this is, <laughs> in a way, you know, God-given. So what can we do about it? The point is that they should accommodate themselves with the new situation. They have, they have got used to the situation in which Iran is contained by the United States, and then they can do whatever they want. And now it's changing. Well, it, it has started to change under Obama. We don't know what happens under Trump. But if that continues, then they have to accommodate themselves with a new situation. If, if, if they really want to have a competition in economy, it's, it's OK. But then uh, they should you know, put aside all this uh, you know, blame game and accusations about Sunni, Shia, you know, Arab, Persian. That's wrong. I mean, you know, look at Europe. I mean, we still have you know, competition between France and Germany in a way. But that's, you know, that's a normal competition. We don't need to be hostile, right? So I think this is something that that's actually, uh, with, with, you know, with all respect, that's, that's their problem. If Iran is rising, that's, that's their problem. And they have, to, they have to accommodate themselves. We can't stop because, because they are not happy. This is, this is not true. Um, in, 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 in terms of oil, uh, you're right. Uh, you know, I don't agree with uh, the cheap oil because it's, it's still something, I think the cost of production of shale oil is about $70, you know, about $70. So if uh, oil which is produced in the Middle East at, you know, at the current price, which is almost 50, like 40, $50, I think it's still uh, more economic than, than shale. But the point is, that United States has become independent of Middle East oil. This is the point. The point is not that the United States is going to compete with Middle East oil. The point is that, it, that, you know, that the US is not going to import anymore. But, you know, especially Trump has, um, uh, has said that he will, uh, you know, I can't remember the technical term, uh, the, 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 um, the horizontal wells. 
uh, which have been banned, I think, by law in the United States, and he's going to allow that. It's a technical, you know, it, you know it's a kind of technology that if they, do, you know, if, you know, if they use, they can even, you know, produce more oil. Um, so I think sooner or later, uh, the, you know, the U.S. will be completely independent of Middle East oil, and in that sense, the U.S. You know, even under Trump, I don't think that they will continue spending so much uh, for military expenditure in the Middle East. They will, they, you know, they will definitely reduce that. Even Trump has said it openly that Saudi Arabia and other countries in the region they should pay for the services that they receive. Why should send our troops and then pay all of these costs? So even under Trump, we think that he's not going to um, send like you know you know, large troops or, you know, deploy, you know, troops to Middle East or to wage another war. The point is that the U.S. is trying to somehow, you know, keep away a little bit, not to, not to lose control. Of course, they will keep their, you know, military bases in the Middle East. But I think, you know, Trump will actually reduce some of military expenditures um, in the region. And, you know, they will try to make China maybe more engaged because China is basically the main uh, consumer of Middle East oil, uh, so they say, okay, if, if you know, if, if you really want to consume oil, then you know, please come and provide the security of the energy route yourself. Why should we secure, uh, you know, keep this, you know, secure, and then you come and use the benefit without taking any position? You know, China so far has been quite, you know, neutral in, in the Middle East conflicts. That you know, they they never make any, you know, comments in favor of Iran or Saudi Arabia or Israel. They always say, well, we don't care about it. But I think sooner or later what you say is that the United States is going a little aside, not suddenly, not, not, you know, not overnight, but a little, just, you know, little by little. So, uh, you know, United States will go into the shadow and we, we should expect more, uh, um, you know, intervention or engagement by the Chinese, but we don't know how it will happen. The whole thing is this. If the United States is going to be less involved in the world, in the, whole, in the whole world, I'm not talking about the Middle East. If that is going to happen to the United States, then what is the future of the world? What is going to be the future of the world system? I think what, you know, one of the scenarios is that we will have regional you know, settings, like different islands, that would be connected together. And the, the, you know, the balance between regional uh, you know, settings uh, will actually constitute the world system. So in that sense, one of the regions which is very, very poor in any kind of regional integrity uh, um, um, you know, experience is the Middle East. I think this is a big danger. In Southeast Asia, you have ASEAN, which is very good. Nowadays, you can be proud of it. It's, it you know, it's really, it's, you, know, it, it, you know, it has become like a model. After European Union, we mentioned you know, ASEAN as a model. And I think European Union is actually going down, and you know, perhaps ASEAN will, I mean, will, you know, will, you know, will actually rise up. Uh, in the Middle East, we are quite poor. We don't have any regional system, which is a danger. If United States is not as powerful as in the past, if China does not want to take, uh, you know, to, to become engaged as much as United States was, then who is going to provide the security of this region? Uh, there's no miracle to happen. I think this is the burden, this is the responsibility of the states of the region themselves. And if we don't have a regional setting for that, if you're not prepared, we are going to be the scapegoat of the future, you know, conflicts. Assalamu alaikum, and uh, I try to connect with the professor in Persian. Yeah, you know, Prof, you mentioned about the, in the beginning of the talk about, your, it's not so much a religious message you put across, but rather a political message about tyranny, injustice. And you also further mentioned about how the minorities in outlining areas of the Shia population in, the, in other rest of the countries are minor, and perhaps they face also persecution. So uh, I like to focus on the domestic front rather than international, because we spoke about international front. What I'm referring to is the largest minority community in Iran, Persia. That is the Baha'i community. And uh, I observe a concern that uh, as citizens of the country, they're deprived of their rights. Educational, edu uh, as well as um, employment, and even, that, <clears throat> even then, for those who have scored very high in their university entrance examination were not given a place just because they profess a different religion. 
Now, as citizens of the country, and they are your fellow neighbors, friends, and colleagues, how we talk about, on one hand, the message we put across is on injustice and tyranny. And yet, I find it's a kind of dichotomy that here it's been uh, perpetrated against your own fellow countrymen. So what is it that, uh, that they have uh, been deprived of all this these years too? And uh, this is a question I'd like to pose upon those, um, the yeah. intelligence in your country, as well as those civil society organization who talks about um, rights as well as justice. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good that you know, at the end, we, we actually went back to domestic arena, uh, uh, which I'm not an expert of, but I can share my thoughts with you. Um, well, I think uh, if, if you could make some you know, examples that could clarify more. Uh, we have so many minorities in Iran. This is a, you know, very interesting for you to know that uh, we have you know, Jewish community. We have a diverse Christian community. Almost all churches in Iran have, uh, you know, have a branch. You know, maybe except for Mormons and Pentecost, you know, which are, you know, which are you know, very uh, you know, particular churches. But other churches, they all have uh, their own churches in, in Iran. Um, so we have Jews, we have Christians, we have Zoroastrians. Uh, we have also 10% of Sunni population, yes. which mainly lives on the uh, edge of the country, like the you know, border lines of the country. Uh, you know, nowadays, I, you know, no one claims that the human rights situation in, in, you know, in Iran is, is actually perfect. No one claims that. So you know, first of all, we, we need to you know, acknowledge that there are certain problems, no doubt. This is, this is the first thing. The second thing is that no matter uh, I, you know, if you get convinced or not by my response, it doesn't contradict what I said about foreign policy. because. In foreign policy, you can still send the message of justice and freedom, even if inside your country you have problems. So that does not contradict the whole argument that I posed before. I want to make this clear first. And then, um, in, you know, in terms of human rights, of course there are problems. But the main problem with, with Iran is now about uh, the, you know, the number of executions. Uh, if you go and check with United Nations reports, it's it's you know the main you know the main 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 you know issue is not about minorities it's about executions uh, which is a little higher than uh, than you know than the average rate and that's because in Iran we have very strict laws about you know drug traffickers almost 70% of those who get executed are actually drug traffickers and now they are changing the law they are working to change the law uh, you know, in order to reduce basically the punishment uh, for you know drug trafficking, because it has not also been in, uh, you know effective as much. Uh, so, if we can actually do this change, uh, you know, suddenly our our ranking in human rights in the in, you know in in the global index will actually increase, and you will see that. So, th you know, this is the main problem that is being uh, you know addressed. The other thing about minorities is that nowadays. Uh, the, you know, the Sunnis, if you go to Baluchistan, if you go to Zahedan, you see that they have their own mosque, they have their own school, um, uh, and they have their own teachings of, you know, their own, uh, you know, I, I think in Baluchistan they are Hanafi, so they have the Hanafi, you know, branch. Uh, also in north of Iran, I think it's Hanafi, they, you know, they must be Hanafi. You know, and then we have Shafi'is um, on the western side of the country, um, who actually you know freely practice. They have their own mosque. They have their own uh, you know religious schools. Now we have even a Sunni ambassador. Just you know, President Rouhani appointed the first Sunni ambassador, uh, who who was sent to Vietnam. So maybe you know this is close to you, and. Uh, Many Sunni people are, are actually studying at the university. I had just a class this, this semester. I had a PhD you know, course. One of my five students was Turkmen you know, from, the, from the Turkmen side of Iran, and he was Sunni. And he was there at the PhD level in, in the University of Tehran. He had no problem. So I don't think there's any open discrimination in that sense that they cannot follow their education or they cannot can, you know, gain jobs because they are Sunni. Maybe in some certain you know, positions in the government, uh, it's banned.
for the Sunnis to gain position, but even at the level of ambassador, they can now be active. Uh, but maybe we have no Sunni minister or, or you know, cabinet member, this is true, but we have parliament members who are Sunni. So even in the parliament, we have Sunni members. In the executive branch, we have ambassadors. And you know, I don't really see a, you know, a main problem in that sense. Some of the problems are even the same. If you, if you talk about poverty or things like that, if you go to Khuzestan, you know, for example, which is the oil-rich you know, province of Iran, the main population is Shiite. You know, they are Shiite. I mean, they, you know, they are Arab, but they are Shiite. And they have the same level of poverty as you know, perhaps you find in a Sunni you know, province. So it's not you know, that this deprivation has happened because someone is Sunni or, you know, or Shiite, because we have not had a very good development plan in the country. Uh, the center is more developed than the periphery. So, the since, so since the Sunnis actually live in the periphery side, they yeah. are some, uh, sometimes they are actually poorer, I agree that. Perhaps I'm quite polite in my words, but to be a little bit more precise, mm -hmm. just lately in uh, the province of Semnan, Baha'is have died, so is Yazd. And just for the sake of uh, the other belief, and there's even one girl by the age of 18, 17, by the name of Mona. She was asked to recant the faith. Of course, she declined, and she was put into gallows. So even then, there are many of these Baha'i so-called leaders, but they are prominent Baha'is, who have been imprisoned for trump up charges. And they've been serving since 2008. So I suppose that these are some of the deprivation which we talk about it. Let, let aside those de uh, desecration of their graves. So as I said, no, you talk about justice. You talk about uh, freedom of uh, practice of religion. But here again, it is denied their own fellow citizens. So you're talking about more than 300 of the fellow members. Many have left, leaving 300,000 people there. And yet the richness of the culture of the talent has been deprived because of this absence of these 300 uh, so-called residents or Iranian uh, population. I agree with you that you know, cultural diversity is part of Iranian identity and we should really keep that safe because the whole civilization that we have inherited has been made by you know, diversity of people, not by just one single you know, tribe or race. And you know, as I said, homogeneity is, is not diversity. Homogeneity is more you know, oppression. So in a way, I, you know, I also agree with you that we don't need a homogeneous nation. You know, Iran is not a homogeneous nation and should not become a homogeneous nation. We need diversity, and uh, you know, I also agree with you. If you, if you can, you can actually add the list. I mean, this is you know, the list can actually continue. But it's you know, almost in every country, you can have that list of human rights problems. I don't think that you can mention any country in the world who is perfect. And uh, we also don't claim to be perfect, so there, there's no you know, principal disagreement here. My name is Julia. Uh, uh, I'm from Asia West East Institute. Just a short commentary, Mariam, please. Uh, I wanted to refer to the question posed by uh, Dato Rezwan with regards to the new alliance forming between Iran and Russia. Uh, Dato Rezwan. We also, uh, we also, we're also interested in Russia about that, and many analysts would like to see a strategic alliance, but it's not happening, and it's been 25 years after the Soviet Union, and it's also not happening, although we still uh, keep thinking of the ways how we can make this happen. But the thing is, and as uh, uh, Dr. Ahui said, put this right, that uh, people in Iran are concerned about how the Iran card is going to be played after uh, Trump uh, steps into the office. But the same way we see it in Moscow, and we think what's going to happen if uh, Rouhani's team gets upper hand for years to come, and Iran is going to align with America. So we have the uh, same discourse from both sides, and I think the problem is like with the topic that we actually gathered here to discuss today, religion and politics, the problem between Iran and Russia is that we don't talk and we still don't know each other very well. So we cannot speak of any strategic alliance uh, for now, even with the example that we see now uh, in cooperation on Syria, which is very flimsy, is you also. The second thing, I, j just a sh another short commentary, uh, why we all are trying to be here, as Dr. Miri put it, uh, 
revolutionary, trying to talk about values and human rights and everything. I think I think another thing should ro ro should drain our discourse today. Like uh, we all didn't notice with Trump, with Syria, with the conflicts all over the world that during have, have any one of you heard that during uh, Catholic Christmas some very important project was launched on the Middle East. Uh, this is called, I quote, synchrotron light for experimental science and applications in the Middle East, short Sizami. And uh, it is the particle accelerator. And I just wanted to draw your attention which countries took part in this scientific project. These are Bahrain, Cyprus, Egypt, Iran, Israel, which is not acknowledged by Iran, Bahrain, which doesn't have the uh, diplomatic relationship with Israel, Jordan, Pakistan, which doesn't acknowledge Israel, Palestine, and Turkey, which doesn't acknowledge Cyprus. And it's all directed by UNESCO. And they launched this project right during the Catholic Christmas, disregarding ISIS, Syria, Trump, and everything. And I think this is what we should be doing and what we should be talking about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because actually there was some mentioning about Russia, Iran, and things like that. I, uh, I think we have a little bit to, uh, I think Iranians should be a little bit yes. too critical about their own understanding. Why? Because all the time, I mean, we hear in Iran that people say, or even officials, if people on the street, they talk about that, we say, okay, people on the street. But you know, when officials, even official line is that, you know, Russia is not reliable. You cannot rely on Russians. Or they play with Iranian cards. I don't know whoever, I mean, who has played, in, I mean, uh, cards here. I have played cards since I was very, I mean, seven, eight years old. You know, when you play cards, you have cards and your rival or the one you are actually playing cards. He has cards as well. If Russia is playing with Iranian cards, so Iranians should play with the Russian card. It's like, you know, I mean, if you follow the discourse, it's always like Iranians are victims and they can't do anything. Mm -hmm. The hands are, you know, bounded. No, it's not like this, actually. I think we need to have a different understanding. First of all, at the political level, you cannot ask between nation states the concept we use yeah, should be very accurate. Yeah. We cannot say, for example, the relation between two states should be based on trust. Okay, yes. Of course, nobody talks about trust. One I, I mean, the, in the one state minute. system. Yeah, one minute I have? 30 seconds. That's it. Well, you said one minute, then you said 30 seconds. Yeah. Okay, anyway, so I think we need to change a little bit our approach when it comes to international relations. It's not about reliance or it's not about trust. It's not about friendship. It's about how to find common grounds which, we, which would be beneficial for two states. And that is something which is missing there. We talk a lot about the radicalization of state-centered power politics and position of Islamic Ummah, the way out. And Dr. Awi has suggested few solutions to the problem. So, um, so uh, after this, we we would go to a more uh, non-violent discussion about Arabic Zapin, which will be moderated by my friend here, Hasman. Okay, and then I would like to thank Dr. Mahdi Awi very much for his um, for his sharing for the sharing of his great knowledge.